Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Digging Deeper, Make Creativity Your Business Advantage. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Today on the show, New York Times bestselling author Jay Baer is with us. He's the author of six books. His latest physical book is called Talk Triggers, The Complete Guide to Creating Customers with Word of Mouth. He's also a Word of Mouth Marketing and National Speakers Association Hall of Fame member. So we're going to go into both of those topics today. I'm keenly interested in Jay's take on uh, what happens to events and speakers now. He's authored a very useful guide for virtual events that we'll touch on as well. So go ahead and start pumping your questions for Jay into the comment sections wherever you are joining us on the show. If you have a question about content marketing, digital marketing, word of mouth marketing, events and speaking and all that stuff, he can probably answer it. So take advantage of that and start pumping your questions uh, in over there. After we exhaust Jay this morning, this early in the morning, I want to chat a little bit about last night's first part of And She Could Be Next. It's a two-part documentary about inspiring women of color to be leaders, community activists. It opens up the conversation about the challenges that women of color and non-white races face in having a voice in America. It's compelling. It's worth watching. It's worth discussing with your friends and certainly discussing with your children too, especially if you're white and maybe your life is a little homogenized a bit. So I think we've all been undergoing a little bit of self-reflection there lately uh, on the uh, white side of the aisle. And so let's break down that aisle a little bit more. Uh, part two of that two-part documentary is tonight. It'll be on Amazon Prime afterwards. And in a few weeks, we're going to have one of the documentary's producers, Jyoti Sarda, right here on the show. So I want everybody to catch up with that. And I want to talk a little bit about last night's first episode here in a few minutes. But... First, we've been doing um, a lot more live streams for clients at Cornette, largely because they watch Digging Deeper and know we have the capabilities, can help them launch web videos and live streams for the brands. Our friends at the Buffalo Trace Distillery are having Whiskey Wednesdays now each week, which we help produce. We've done some live stream broadcasts and video content for Visit Lex, the Convention and Visitors Bureau of Lexington, Kentucky. And we're in the middle of prepping a fun companion show for Keeneland's summer racing meet next week. They won't have fans in the stands, but we're going to do a little pregame show show for them on the interwebs. And then of course they simulcast the races. So because I'm knee deep in all this, I've been asked a dozen times now how we make it happen. Well, I've been telling you for over a year now about Switcher Studio. That's our production software, but there's another important component to live streaming the way we do. Switcher Studio is for production Restream is what we use for distribution. So Restream or Restreamio, since their URL is .io, takes the feed from Switcher Studio, the program output, if you will, um, and broadcasts that to up to 30 different social networks and video platforms. Um, the individual paid plans start at $19 a month where you can broadcast to more than one destination at a time. So Facebook and YouTube. When you get to premium pricing, you can go as high as 20 different destinations at once. This live stream right now is currently happening on six different channels. We are on the Cornette Facebook and LinkedIn pages, the Digging Deeper YouTube channel, and uh, my Facebook uh, and LinkedIn pages too. If we felt the need, we could add the stream to Twitter via Periscope. Facebook events, Twitch, Daily Motion, Mixer, Major League Gaming, hoo ya, we can go crazy. Uh, multiple profiles too on each of those networks. So not just one place on Facebook, we're going to multiple places on Facebook. So if you don't have the need for a Switcher Studio level production suite, Restream also has its own live studio where you can load in the basics, the lower thirds, the logos, the backgrounds and whatnot. So you can look professional. Uh, Switcher Studio does a little bit more, but for Restream, for as little as $19 per month, you can broadcast to two different locations uh, for the uh, upgrade price, obviously, uh, for $99 a month. You can be live streamed in 10 different places online, and then you can go up to 20, of course. You know what that means, though? When YouTube came out, a lot of us said that uh, now you can be your own TV station. Well, Restream makes it so that you can be your own TV network and you can be in multiple places at once with your live streams. Go to jason.online slash Restream to sign up and get started. Broadcast your live stream everywhere with Restream. That address, again, it's on your screen right now, jason.online slash Restream. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who are interested in the Buffalo Trace uh, Distillery's Whiskey Wednesdays, tomorrow at 2 o'clock on the Buffalo Trace Distillery and Buffalo Trace brand Facebook pages, uh, I believe the legendary Freddie Johnson will be uh, talking through uh, the bottling situation in from the Blanton bottling warehouse. So that's going to be really interesting for those of you who are bourbon aficionados. Uh, 
Uh, if you're dialing into the live broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, thanks to Restream, you can jump in the comment section there and ask questions uh, for me or of Jay, of course. You can interact with us here on the show. That's another really cool benefit of Restream is all the comments come into one place, so I don't have to bounce around looking for y'all. Restream brings y'all to me. So at least jump into the comments and say hello. It doesn't tell me who's watching, just who's saying something. So if you don't comment, I don't see you there. So let me know you're following along. I need to, I'd like to say hello to you if I can. And if you have questions for Jay, uh, please jump in and ask them because he's here to answer them. If you are watching or listening to the show after the fact and would like to join us in the future, just follow me or Cornette on LinkedIn or Facebook or look for Digging Deeper on YouTube and you'll get that handy live notification when we go live. That's normally 8 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday mornings. Look for me online at Jason Falls. I'm Jason Falls all over the place. And uh, you can typically find Cornette at Team Cornette. The Digging Deeper YouTube channel, by the way, is jason.online slash dig deep. So you can go find that. All right. Enough of my blabbering. Uh, Jay Bear is here with us today. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the Jay Bears. Uh, he needs no introduction, but for those not uh, familiar with him, uh, he is the New York Times bestselling author of Talk Triggers, Hug Your Haters, Utility, The Now Revolution. He leads Convince and Convert, one of the premier content marketing and social strategy agencies in the space. He's a word of mouth marketing and National Speaker Association Hall of Famer. His only flaw is he prefers tequila to bourbon. So good morning, old plaid paladin. How are you? Paul, it's great to be here. It's fantastic that you're putting all this together. Love the Whiskey Wednesdays concept as well. Spectacular. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's never too early for tequila. Um, and so, you know, we can go that route. Ask me questions about that in the, in the chat as well. We'll help you to. Yeah, ask questions. You could ask him about the, and just in case I got a little, I got a little sip of Weller. There we go. One. Right there. Just, in, just case in case we're going to toast. We can go that later. route. Sure. Yeah, I keep that in the drawer. Keep it under his chair. Nice. Yeah, well done. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. Got to have it handy. Nice. Never know when you're going to need one. Nice. Okay. So I want to dive into this Facebook thing real quick. Yeah. Uh, I got a dozen things I want to talk to you about. Right. But um, Unilever, Coca Cola, Starbucks, Hershey, yeah. Honda, a bunch have jumped on the anti hate speech walkout bandwagon. Yeah. Um, they're not going to advertise on Facebook. The Anti Defamation League originally called for <laughs> a, an out, a ban for July only. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Unilever and a couple others have said, well, we're not going to do it for the rest of the year and, or we're not going to do it on Facebook and a bunch of other social networks. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the financial impact is already being felt. Facebook's, you know, looking, I think they were down 8% on Friday in terms of stock price. Uh, I saw one headline that said $7 billion lost uh, just on the, on the early onset of this. What do you think the outcome of this is going to be? What, what do you think Facebook's going to do here? The challenge with this initiative, we've had several conversations with clients over the last 48 hours about this exact topic. The, the challenge is that the, the goals of this initiative and, and measuring against those goals are a little bit murky, right? It's Facebook, make some steps to do this and, and put out a policy to do that. And so they're, they're, they're not really what we would call smart goals in marketing, right? They're not really measurable in a classic sense. And so I think the concern is, uh, how do you know when you have been satiated and therefore it is okay uh, to, to re-advertise on Facebook? That, that concerns me a little bit just as a movement. However, uh, I think Facebook is going to have to do something, even, even, if, it's, even if it's lip service, even if it's um, a half measure, e even if it's insufficient. I think zero action is unsustainable because this is gathering momentum in a way that uh, I really haven't seen very often in my long career, nor did I frankly expect. I, I, it, is, it is not as difficult for big brand advertisers, Unilever, Coca-Cola, now Pepsi, uh, Honda, et cetera, to, to, to eschew Facebook and Instagram because you can pick up that kind of tonnage from a reach standpoint in a lot of other ways, right? Mm -hmm. You can give Google some more money. You can give Twitter some more money. You can do some more work with Spotify or, or radio, or there's a lot of other ways to, to generate reach. What I found particularly interesting, Jason, is now you've got a large number of e-commerce and DTC advertisers signing on. People like uh, Patagonia and Eddie Bauer and Birchbox, people who don't just rely on Facebook for, for awareness, but rely on Facebook for actual sales. And that I found uh, to be something with, with real bite, because I think about 
if I'm the marketing director for Birchbox and and we generate positive ROI on every Facebook ad and every Instagram ad, uh, and we say we're not going to do that anymore, at least for July and maybe longer, where do those sales come from? Mm -hmm. And maybe the answer is we don't know and we don't care because uh, you know this is our pitchfork and this is and 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 there are more important things than sales and profits and this is one of them and so we're going to take a stand and if that means we miss our second quarter numbers we're probably going to miss them anyway because it's a pandemic after all uh, but that's the kind of conversation I've been having with our clients is should you do this well probably just from a hey let's make society better perspective but you also have to figure that there are probably going to be some business consequences and and the calculus that i think you have to have and i don't want this to sound particularly craven or crass and maybe it does but if you're going to sign on for this you better have a public relations strategy for you signing on to it mm -hmm. because otherwise all you're doing is truncating your own reach and then not gaining any public relations benefits simultaneously right mm -hmm. so it's the worst of both worlds now again there are a lot of societal this is the right thing to do reasons to do that anyway but from a pure business standpoint, I think not only does it put Facebook in a pickle, I think it puts a lot of brands in a pickle. I mean, we've had conversations in my own company about, hey, should we not do any Facebook advertising in July? Not like we're a huge advertiser, but we definitely advertise our webinars and our eBooks and our seminars and other things. You know, we spend a few thousand dollars a month on Facebook and, you know, you wonder, should we keep doing that? So it, it is fascinating to see uh, how this snowball is accelerating. Uh, and maybe this is the time. I mean, there's been, Jason, you know, there's been so many circumstances in the past where people have said, screw Facebook and we boycott and we <laughs> sign a petition. And, you know, and, and I mean, this is not the first time people have sort of said rally around how much we hate Facebook, right. but maybe this is the one that's got enough economic con consequence that something actually happens. I don't know. So I, I've, I've had a couple of, of stems from that you know, sort of response in that conversation. One that I've been having with our clients here and, and it might, again, I, it, at the risk of sounding, you know, somewhat crass in the overall you know purpose of what the, the boycott is. Um, I w I've, I've said out loud a couple of times, look, the uh, advertisers are walking away um, and that's going to have an impact, but are the people actually walking away? Are, are the customers actually walking away? And I think you alluded to it a little bit there because if these brands walk away from Facebook, but their customers don't, and they don't have an, another place to replace that the sales you know, channel and acquisition and conversions and whatnot, are we sort of committing a little bit, a version of sort of, you know, brand Harry Carey a bit by, you know, walking away from, you know, the audience and walking away from where we're not fishing where the fish are. Are people going to leave Facebook? Because I don't really get the sense they are. That's such a good point, Jason, because typically what happens is, is consumers get fed up with something um, and, and, then, and then they sort of, quote unquote, boycott the brands who are supporting the thing that the consumers no longer support. Uh, and, and then that forces the brands. If you think about the number of, of um, controversial radio hosts or YouTube channels or or it's it's legion the number of circumstances where consumers have have boycotted advertisers who are sponsoring a particular show or some of that kind of content and then usually those advertisers uh, have to have to flee uh, but i think you're exactly right this is the first time that i can remember and i haven't put a tremendous amount of research into this but the first time that i can remember where an actual uh, sort of decision like this was led by the brands not led by the consumers mm -hmm. and i think that does make it different uh, i think it makes it particularly scary for Facebook, uh, because if people are saying to your point, we're not going to give you money, even if our audience isn't leading this, if I'm Facebook, I'm like, Oh, well, that's a new wrinkle. Uh, mm -hmm. but from a business standpoint, you're also exactly right. If you're like, look, we're just not going to play in that sandbox yet. All of your customers are still in that sandbox. I mean, have we, what have we actually accomplished? I don't know. It's interesting. Well, and, and and that also leads to another question for brands. You know, we can we can pull our ad dollars and we can, you know, have the PR behind that and say, look, we're standing for what's right. We're doing what's right for the world and pull our ad dollars. But are they also going to participate on Facebook organically in July? Is that is that part of the equation? Right. Are these brands going to comp pull completely out and not touch their audience at all? Or are they going to you know, in a, in a kind of an economic version of lip service, we're not going to pay you money, but oh my God, your audience is really important to us. So we're going to stay here. 
Yeah. Uh, and what I wonder where, where this, where this, you know, you fast forward 18 months um, and you and I have talked about this in multiple occasions throughout the history of social media as we currently know it. Is this another inflection point where brands will decide, you know what, we're just going to DIY this. We're, we're going to build our own owned community. Uh, and instead of using a third party to build community, as many brands have, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go do it ourselves. We're going to go back to the Harley owners group and the Starbucks community and the things that that, you know, uh, the, the you know, Fiskers, Scissors, you know, all those kind of things that are sort of legendary uh, community building case studies. Well, one of the things that makes all those interesting is that you weren't building your house on rented land. And I think there's one thing that we're learning right now, and, and I've said it over and over and over and over for years and years and years. When you build your house on rented land, and Facebook is certainly rented land, you don't control that house. And this is what happens, right? You, you threw in with Facebook because they had the reach in the audience, and now you don't like the way they handle the algorithm. It's like, well, you could have been building your own community on your own website the last decade, and you choose to not do that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we'll see if that changes. Well, and I think there's, you know, the, the brand argument you make very well, that makes a lot of sense to me. But I also think when you when you think about the wider consumer attracting people to a place like that, I think there's only a certain percentage of the population that wants to go into a branded community where the focus is the brand or That's the community right. around the brand. Like, I'm not going to go to the Harley owners group to check on my mom, you know, because she's not going to be there. Right. I hope. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, you're right that brands have to be able to potentially find another option. And so I, I realize that the branded community uh, might be your answer to this question, but if we're not going to be focusing from a brand perspective on Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp or anything else that Facebook owns, if we want to make this, you know, ethical moral stance, where do we go? Where, where do brands go to, where do you fish when, when you're not going to ethically fish where most of the fish are, what's next? Depends on the brand, obviously, and the composition of their audience. But the first obvious answer would be Google, mm -hmm. which feels a little bit like out of the frying pan into the fire, doesn't it? Like it's <laughs> it's not as if oh here's a benevolent actor let's let's uh, let's these guys have everybody's best interest at heart let's go there. But that that is the you know from a pure digital standpoint that's the play, right? It's it's. It's pull money from Facebook, give it to Google, uh, and try and re reach an equivalency there. Uh, it's not Twitter, uh, you know, maybe for a few brands here or there, but but Twitter's uh, you know daily user base is so much smaller um, than than Facebook. It's it's not really apples and apples. It's like apples and you know spiders or something. Uh, it's just not really the same thing. Uh, for for some B two B brands, you might see additional LinkedIn spending. Uh, but again, the the economics on LinkedIn are so different, right? The the cost per click is so much higher, uh, generally speaking, that you you have to be selling some pretty pricey stuff for that to make sense as well. Um, maybe you see more display, right? Maybe you see more kind of going back to the quote unquote banner days and and more digital display ads. You might also see uh, a resurgence if this sticks longer than thirty days. You might see a resurgence of native advertising, of, mm -hmm. of brands doing more um, advertorial sponsored content. Uh, you know, more of those kind of executions. And, and ultimately, the answer might be YouTube, right? You might not find your mom on YouTube, but but you can find a lot of other people there. That's true. So uh, John Steyert, one of our, our mutual friends, Love uh, jumps in and says, new father, uh, it, John Steyert. Look new at, father, look at congratulations. It's lunchtime for him. Congratulations, John. Uh, is it possible that these CPG sales are made up from an awareness point of view based on the bump from news coverage? And how would this impact B2B? So you touched on that a little bit, but yes, your take on that? for 20 minutes. <laughs> that's my answer. I mean, and that's what I told my clients. Like, if you're going to do this, you have to have a press release. Yeah. Um, but but if you're going to not advertise for a month, do you still get sales benefits a month from now? No, yeah. no way. No way. Nobody gives uh, nobody gives a hoot about that. No one's going to remember it in 30 days. 30 days right now is like 30 years uh, in the 1920s in terms of the, the daily crazy. Uh, so so <laughs> in a lot uh, of ways. No. Uh, yes. For, for, for the first week, John is exactly right. Beyond that, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. 
Uh, interesting comment here, not really a question, but Milton Ali says North Face boycotting in July is tantamount to Cold Stone Creamery not advertising in wintertime. They don't sell <laughs> coats in the summertime. So Raven's a good point. Eddie Bauer as well, one of them. I didn't think yep. about that. Uh, but but I, I didn't think about the seasonality. I love that. It's hilarious. Uh, it is. But, but I do I do wonder. Uh, again, I'm trying not to be as you know. As some of you know, my background, long time ago, I was a political campaign consultant. My background is in election politics. So uh, <laughs> please excuse me if the things <laughs> I'm about to say or the things I'm saying today feel particularly Machiavellian. It is how I was trained. Uh, but I do wonder if if the if the disruption in sales patterns in everything due to the pandemic actually makes it easier to do something like this, right? So when, when the economy is great, and it's business as usual, you know, would it have been as easy for Unilever or anybody else to do this in, in July, 2019? I actually really question that. Yeah, I would, it's, it's definitely, I think that definitely was a foundational predicated, predicating factor on what's going yeah, it's on. It's like here. things are already screwed up. So let's just screw them up a little bit more to make a point. Like, all right. Hey, if that's what it takes to make the world a better place, I'm all for it. Yeah. So and I well, would. like I said, though, the challenge I have with this as a, I'm, 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 I've been critical of Facebook from the jump, uh, full acknowledgement that I am a shareholder mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not stupid. Uh, <laughs> but I will say this. Um, I just don't know how we know when they've done what this initiative is asking them to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what's the finish line scorecard? Um, right. And that's the part that bugs me. Yeah. Yeah, right now it seems like let's just hurt their pocketbook for a little while and then get back to business as usual. And I'm not sure if that's going to be the ultimate win. So while we're on the topic, obviously the social unrest has has uh, you know built a big uh, put a big cautionary blanket over marketing of any kind right now. So day to day, we're making calls with our clients. I'm sure you are too on whether or not we should even be posting anything on social media, right. depending upon the news of the day. Some clients want to be actively involved in that social change process. Uh, in relevant ways. Others just want to be respectful, stay out of the way. Still others are kind of oblivious to it and have quarterly reports to fill with numbers. So they're deaf to what's going on. For brands out there who may have the perspective of, you know what, we make X product, the social or political perspective of a person doesn't affect whether or not they want to use our product. Mm -hmm. We just want to do what we do well and stay out of this. What 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 do you say to them? Can Can brands really be quiet anymore? I think you can be quiet. And many brands are, and they're not being hurt necessarily. But you have to question what is your obligation as a brand. And I think you also have to understand that at some point, the balkanization of the public means that we will continue to support brands who we believe fit our own narrative and we will not support brands who support a different narrative or no narrative whatsoever. So I, I do think you can you can be quiet and try and stick to your knitting and kind of bowl it down the middle and thread the needle and any other metaphors that I could conjure in this real time environment. But you're doing so at the risk of not creating any kind of bond with your audience. Because if you don't stand for anything, then then why are you asking consumers to make you their favorite? Yeah. And that's scary, right? Because because typically for most brands, you look at brands like Patagonia and others who who have really leaned into uh, a perspective for many, many years and, and have succeeded accordingly. Um, you know, as a as a as a branding professional, Jason, I'm, I'm sure you would agree that, um, you know, you're better off standing for something uh, as opposed to trying to get every client uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and them not really caring one or the other. But most brands don't think like that. You know, most brands goal is to is to not offend uh, and, and, and have the largest possible addressable market. But as Mark Schaefer's talked about um, over the last couple of years, I don't think that's that dog will hunt anymore. I mean, yeah. I think you, you are being forced by society to take a stand on any number of issues. Uh, and, and you're going to have to eventually. Do you have to do it right now? No, I think brands still have another year uh, before they're gonna have to really make some sort of a decision. Um, but ultimately that decision is gonna have to be made. And the hard part is that decision is not made by the marketing department, right? Yep. We, we, it's executed by the marketing department. 
But the marketing department doesn't dictate the values of an organization, especially an enterprise organization, right? That's got to come from, from above. Uh, and it's also why it's not a surprise that most of the brands that have strong values, not all, but most have very strong executives, right? Mm -hmm. They have a strong board, they have a strong owner, they have a strong CEO. It's much easier to create a culture when that culture is from the top down. Yep. Matthew Dooley chimes in, silence speaks volumes, which right. well, we've so. heard that before and it's absolutely true. So I, I try not to, to make this show uh, political for intentional reasons. Uh, we are skirting the line a little bit. So I'd like to kind of shift to talk about something less political anyway. Um, first of all, congratulations. I don't think we've talked since uh, personally since you were inducted into the National Speaker Association oh, Hall of Fame. Thanks. That's kind of impressive. Um, doesn't speak like seem like very long ago you joined the NSA and yeah. now all of a sudden you're in the Hall of Fame. That's a uh, yeah, it was uh, it's a surprise uh, to me as well. Thank you. Um, it's it's strange, you know. Typically, you know, you're a sports guy, Jason. Uh, you know, Hall of Fame is five years post retirement, right? And you're like, hey, man, I'm still giving speeches. <laughs> I don't I give the trophy back. Uh, it is uh, it's a great honor, and and more than anything else, it's uh, it's really cool to to just be able to interact with um, some of the other people who are, who have that designation, it's, it's a truly interesting, uh, and, and, uh, accomplished group of folks. So yeah, I, the NSA has been very, very good to me as an organization. That's awesome. So in, in light of, of, of COVID-19, obviously events everywhere being canceled or at least converting to virtual, yeah. uh, for a lot of our friends out there speaking, event planning, trade show people that we know real well, yeah. it's either a big part or all of their revenue. So how bad is the situation for folks in the world? And then let's talk about what people can do to, to pivot who are in those roles. Well, I mean, look, uh, there are people literally dying. Uh, we have an unemployment rate of whatever the numbers are now, 15, 16% in this country. Um, so there are literally millions or tens of millions of people who are worse off than the worst off speaker. Uh, so I, 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 I want to caution this statement uh, by, by saying I have real perspective about what a downside is. Uh, and not giving any speeches is is uh, a downside for sure, but it it's certainly not life and death. The question I have is not what's going to happen for the next six months, because the answer is primarily there's going to be no events other than small, um, homogenous, 40-person workshops that are socially distant. And some people are already doing that kind of work. I have not. Um, not because I don't want to, it just hasn't been asked. So, so it's going to be all virtual, I think, at least till Christmas, uh, generally speaking. And my question, though, is what happens after that? Mm -hmm. You know, that let's say there's a vaccine. Let's say there's a whatever. Um, do we go back to how the way it used to be in the sort of events business? Because just like work from home, I think the longer you go without doing it the old way, the more accommodations you make and you realize, you know what, doing this event online actually has some innate advantages. You know, it's cheaper, substantially cheaper. Uh, nobody has to leave their house. We don't have to pay for hotel rooms. We don't have to pay for chicken. Uh, <laughs> it's more flexible. We can record it easier, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so while, of course, uh, some live events will come back because you can't replace that sort of face-to-face -face interaction over, over, um, over bourbon in the bar, I think some of the other events that that have been live will not come back. Will mm. will continue to be virtual just because the unit economics of that make more sense. Sure. Um, the same way that you know you've got big organizations saying, you know what, don't come back to work, just work yeah. from home forever. Right? We don't want to pay commercial real estate prices. You're good. Just stay where you are. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that's what will happen, and that will of course have a massive impact uh, on the industry. But I got to tell you, I'm all for it. Uh, I, I didn't realize, Jason, uh, how stressed out uh, traveling every single week made me until I stopped doing it. Yep. The longest I'd ever been home in a row since 2003 was 22 days in a row. That was the longest for 17 years. <laughs> and I've now been home for a hundred days or I don't know, more than that, a lot. Uh, and... And I actually really, really like it. And I'm not going back. Yeah. Uh, you know, I will I will do. I mean, you will see me on a stage someday. But the chances of me doing 65 to 70 live events a year are 0%. It's not going to happen. I don't care how much money they give me. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. 
I'm it's, out. It, it'll definitely wear you out. And I'm, you know, I was there for a few years, uh, right before you took off with your books. I had my little, my little, my little handbook that I, that I promoted for a while. Still it's a great book. It's still one of the best books on small business, social media and marketing ever written. Well, I, I, I wow. That's, thank you for saying that. I appreciate, I, I certainly feel that way. I completely um, agree. But, uh, uh, and it, and you know, it's, it sold okay, but I, I was out there dancing around for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, and then I didn't intentionally write a book for a while because I was just exhausted. Yeah. And so I started focusing on client things and things like that. And, and to be honest with you, the last, whatever it's been six, eight years, uh, since I've been traveling intensively have, have been nice. Um, now I've got a new book coming out and I'm going to, you know, redo that to a degree, but now that, you know, events are going to be different. I love sitting here and doing it from my, my house. This is you. a hell of a lot easier. Yep. Uh, and, and look what people are, people are starting to realize and it just takes time, right? It's just, it's, it just takes at bats. Yeah. People are realizing that a live event can be so much better than the regular webinar they've sat in their whole life. Uh, I'm doing a lot now of, I shouldn't say a lot, a fair bit of, of sort of virtual summit MC and production work. My team mm -hmm. and I have done a lot of virtual events for a decade. So we have a lot of experience in it long before the pandemic and, and, and just making it interesting and fun and interactive and different and, um, you know, multimedia and, and things like that. You know, I've had so many clients say, wow, that was so much better than I thought a virtual event could ever be. And that kind of thinking is what will keep people off of a live event trajectory. So I think once enough people have had truly positive experiences with virtual events, uh, we'll start to see a little bit of a, of a change uh, in, in how all that works. It is paralyzing for meeting planners though. It is really hard for them. Those who have always done live events, the, just, it's so daunting to say, okay, what's the technology platform and what's the run of show and how do you get people to sign up? And it's just, you know, things that I take for granted and you take for granted because we've been doing it for a long time for, for people who have never done virtual and have always done live. It is, it is a scary, scary neighborhood, which is why we're actually doing some consulting just on that. Like, even if I'm not on the microphone, like we'll help you figure yeah. it out, um, yeah. which is an interesting business that of course didn't exist three months ago. That's true. Let's pull back a little bit now from a, a more broad marketing perspective, because you don't just, you know, you're not just a talking head. Uh, you actually do strategy consulting with clients and whatnot. So uh, with in light of the COVID you know, thing, I, I wonder what you've seen from your clients at Convince and Convert during the shift. How many are pushing forward toward backing off? Uh, is anyone still playing it by ear? And then maybe have any of your clients surprised you with their responses to the pandemic? It's such an interesting mixed bag because we have a wide variety of clients. So we have a lot of higher ed clients now. And of course, they they are are in real time trying to figure out how to reopen campus and how to message around that. Uh, and, and it actually it's interesting, Jason, it differs a fair bit based on the campus and where they are in the US, right? So we have mm -hmm. some clients in Arizona, which obviously has seen some case spikes, which creates some uncertainty around their reopening schedule. We have other clients in the Northeast where things have kind of simmered down a little bit. Uh, so that's really fascinating. And then we have some other clients in travel and tourism, uh, like uh, Visit California, California Tourism, Hilton Hotels, and some others, and they're not doing nothing, right? I mean, it's just because it, it's just there's nothing to be done uh, right now. Uh, there, it's it's pretty pretty quiet uh, over there, uh, for sure. And and then we've got other clients, especially those on the B two B side, more in the software business, and and others who. Uh, it's it's game on. Uh, you know, you can still buy software from your from your laptop, and most people do. And interestingly enough, because of the lack of live events, which typically generates a lot of awareness and leads for software companies and B two B in general, we're starting to see more of a pivot toward things like this. You know, live uh, live video or webinars or eBooks or custom research, which we also do. So people are taking some of their event budget and turning it into other kinds of assets, which is where John Steyer and his company uh, at Netline come in. They have an amazing system for promoting B2B content and generating leads from it. It's, it's, it's a you know, pandemic is terrible for almost everybody, but there's a few circumstances where it actually uh, works out. And because we're not a specialty firm in a particular category, we sort of get it from all sides. Right. Uh, but even in, you know, what I keep saying, Jason, is it doesn't matter what business you're in. Every business is a startup right now. Ford is a startup. Yep. Because all of the things that we used to take for granted about what customers know, 
you can't take for granted anymore. People don't even know if you're open, much less what you sell, much less what you charge, much less how to buy from you, much less how to get a hold of you. Uh, you probably know my friend, uh, Lori Meacham, who, who runs social customer care at JetBlue. She was on my Social Pros podcast. Uh, we recorded it a week ago or so. I don't think it's out yet. Not out yet. But she said, and you're, this is crazy, huge spike in Google searches for the term, are airlines still in business? Wow. It's just unfathomable, right? So, yeah. so what I keep telling everybody is like, you have to completely rewire, <laughs> rewire all of your customer relationships. And the best thing you can do right now is have an amazing FAQ, which has to be rewritten from scratch, and start to methodically and systematically re-educate your customers on how, how you, they can buy from you. Because nobody knows if you're even open. It is unprecedented. And it sucks and it's terrible. But it's also... I believe the greatest opportunity to create market share you will ever have in your entire life. You, you will never have this chance again to etch a sketch your entire business, to etch a sketch the entire category, to etch a sketch all of your customer relationships or your products or your pricing. You can literally start over right now in a way that you never could before. There are no sacred cows. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is, I think, exhilarating on one hand. Absolutely. It's uh, it. The creative thinking skills are going to have to come into to play here. And if they do, you're going to win. Yep. And if you just kind of sit and wait to see what happens. Eh, oh, you know, gonna, here's an example. Uh, let me let me ask you this. Um, so uh, if you're going to go to a restaurant, uh, you know, all the restaurants in Louisville and Lexington, but let's pretend that you didn't. Uh, and and there is a restaurant you, you've heard about, you're meaning to try. And you go to Yelp, TripAdvisor at all. And and you look for a review for this restaurant or Google reviews. And you see a review from February 1st. Mm -hmm. How much credence do you put in that review right now? None. Literally zero. Yeah. Literally none. So all these people who have all these reviews, none of it matters. You have to start over. You, you essentially, you have, you have as many reviews as you have gotten since the day you reopened. That's wow. how many reviews you actually have. Yeah. And so this whole idea of like, what's your customer experience? versus expectations like that all has to be reset back to zero mm -hmm. and that is crazy we do a lot of customer experience <laughs> consulting now and and it's just it's remarkable you have to like redo the entire operations playbook it's wild yep it's it, and that's uh it's crazy and and it also actually lends to the point something you said earlier is you know one of the big things in the google al algorithm is recency Mm -hmm. And so, and reviews certainly are there. So you mentioned earlier that maybe Google is where people are going to go. Brands are going to go to take away their, spend their money from Facebook and try to find customers that kind of leads right into it. So. Well, that's what we've been telling clients, those who have actual, you know, physical locations that, that when you reopen and as, or as you reopen, you've got to lean hard into review solicitation, not mm -hmm. in a cheesy way, but in a, you know, a good way. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to increase the percentage of your customers who will lead reviews. Uh, because for that exact reason, Jason, it's, you know, the Google fight resets also, uh, it's really, really important to be thinking about that. That's true. Jay, where can people find you on the interwebs? Just wander around until you find me is the easiest. <laughs> just, just kind of, just click around. He's everywhere. <laughs> click around. No, uh, convince and convert.com convince and convert.com is our main site. That's the best place. Uh, thousands of articles, uh, podcasts, ebooks, research for marketers and business owners. Um, social pros is our main podcast all about, uh, enterprise social media strategy, uh, have a new show called standing ovation, which is about, um, speaking. And then I have a brand new show. It's not even out yet, Jason, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I'd love for you to listen to the first episode and let me know what you think. It'll be out in two weeks ish. It's called bold creators. Uh, I'm doing it Ooh. with Wix and it's, uh, where I interview, uh, the proprietor of a, uh, well-known famous, uh, global web design firm. So yeah. each week's a different web design company owner and all about kind of that business. So I'm excited about that show. It's called Bold Creators. That'll be out in a couple of weeks. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that. And if if you're if you're out and about on the Amazons or if you're out and about wandering into a socially distancing, distancy yeah, safety kind Barnes of place, if you're going to Barnes and Noble, look for the big pink talk triggers with yeah, the look for the, the alpacas. Can't miss it. Yeah, it's Jay Bear and Daniel Lemon. By the way, uh, this book, uh, with Jay's permission, Jay and Daniel's permission, uh, played a big part in some of the foundational elements that I present in my new book. So uh, a lot of references in there to that. So good work. Jay, thank you so much for getting up and getting dressed and putting on plaid and all that well, good stuff for I'm not wearing any pants, but I appreciate it. Well, you know, we don't have to, and that's nice. So just don't stand up. <laughs>
Take care, buddy. I, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right. Jay Bear, ladies and gentlemen, he is the man. Uh, New York Times bestselling author, all kinds of books. He he probably uh, doesn't remember this or doesn't know this, but uh, I have uh, because we overshot what we thought we could sell. I think I have about a dozen boxes of Hug Your Haters in my garage. So if anybody wants a copy of Hug Your Haters, I'll just for just for shipping, man, I'll just make sure you get a copy of it. If you want Hug Your Haters, I got some extra copies of that hanging around, which is a good a good thing to do. Uh, and, and I might try to sell them back to Jay at some point if I don't, if nobody else wants them. So that'll be fun. Or I'll, I'll make, I'll get my daughter to make some craft out of them. It'll be fun anyway. So that's good. Uh, I just dropped the links to all Jay bears, uh, places over there in the chat session. So do go find him on the interwebs. If you don't already uh, follow him or are not connected with him, what are you waiting for? Go do that now. And let's look out for that new podcast as well as go listen to social pros. Great learnings there. I listen to that quite a bit. Okay, so if you didn't catch uh, the first half of And She Could Be Next last night on PBS, you missed the first part of An Incredible Journey, but you can catch the second half tonight. The full two-part documentary will be available soon on Amazon Prime, I believe, certainly on PBS's online and app channels. But here's the, the teaser of the show, what they say the show is about. Uh, in a polarized America where the dual forces of white supremacy and patriarchy threaten to further erode our democracy, a game-changing transformation is happening at the grassroots. As demographics shift toward a non-white majority, elections will be decided by Americans inspired to vote for the first time. Many of these voters, who are often poor and largely immigrant, are ignored by politicians and journalists alike. But a defiant group of women of color as candidates and organizers are harnessing the political power of this new American majority. And She Could Be Next, POV's first broadcast miniseries, asks whether democracy itself can be pr preserved and made stronger by those most marginalized. I wanted to share this with you uh, and encourage you to watch it, but more importantly, to ponder it. Think about it. Really think about the place we are in history where so many disenfranchised and ignored voices are finally being heard. Our society is confronting and tearing down racism and prejudice in a more intent and intense way than we have since the 1960s probably, and it's high time we did so. I, for one, have been doing a lot of self-reflection lately. Uh, as a, a middle class white guy, um, you know, it's easy to think, well, I don't really have a horse in the race, but I do. Uh, we're all in the same race together. Uh, and so I've been doing a lot of self-reflection. Uh, I know there are parts of how I view the world which have been influenced by the system, a system which is racist. And I'm not comfortable with that. In fact, I'm, I'm angry that I, while I had no intent to take part in being prejudiced in this world, I subconsciously have been conditioned to be in some instances. Uh, one of Cornette's promises to our community and clients is that everyone in the agency is going to take the Eddie Moore Jr. 21 day challenge for racial equity. It's where for 21 days, not coincidentally, the length of time they say it takes to develop a habit. You do at least one thing that works to better yourself or the world around you by tearing down racism tearing down prejudice, tearing down hatred. Last night, I watched part one. I also did a lot of reading yesterday. Tonight, I'm going to watch part two uh, of, of this uh, show. Um, and um, I uh, am also catching up on a lot of reading and podcasts to better understand the day-to-day -day struggles of people of co color so I can better see where I can be a better partner to them in everything I say and do professionally and personally. You can find out more uh, about the challenge that I'm talking about and what Cornette is doing to improve uh, our less than ideal diversity and uh, previously passive role in doing what's right at our Commit to Change post from June 18th. I'll uh, jump over there and copy and paste a link into the comment section for that. So I challenge you to take part in the challenge, too. Uh, a lot of us at Cornette are doing it. All of us at Cornette are doing it, actually. Uh, so. Uh, the 21 day challenge is actually its own thing. And so let me copy and paste the link to that. So you can actually get to that directly over in the comment section as well. Uh, part two of, uh, and she could be next is tonight. It'll be on Amazon. Uh, it's on PBS, by the way. Uh, it'll be on Amazon prime afterwards. And in a few weeks, actually, we are going to have one of the documentaries producers, Joe T. Sarda will be right here on this show to continue the conversation. So, 
um, do so. Do go watch tonight. Uh, the link uh, for the uh, online version of the show. I'm copying and pasting like crazy today over in the message sections. And they'll be on the show notes if you don't see them in the comments. Uh, but the, the link is pbs.org slash POV slash she could be next. I just copied and pasted that link over there. So do so. Go watch that tonight and take a little part in making yourself better and helping make our world one where fairness, justice, and accountability come first for all. Next week on the show, I'm excited to have Curtis Midkoff here. He is the social strategy lead for Kroger. If you don't know what Kroger and don't have a Kroger brand grocery store in your community are, uh, there's a good chance the grocery store that you do know is owned by them. Uh, Curtis was formerly with Southwest Airlines. He's been a big player in the social strategy space for some time. So next Tuesday, July 7th, live at 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, uh, or later that day on the podcast feed, of course. To get that live stream, follow me or Cornette on Facebook or LinkedIn, or look for Digging Deeper on YouTube to see the stream. That short URL to get to YouTube is jason.online slash dig deep. If you want all the podcast links and all that kind of stuff, you can go to jason.online slash digging deeper, spell it out instead of dig deep, digging deeper, where you can find links to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify. The YouTube link is there and more. If you've been subscribing to the podcast for a while, you're probably listening to the old Jason Falls show feed. If you don't, uh, you don't have to cancel that subscription, but you do need to add digging deeper. It's a separate feed and we don't want you to miss the show once we stop kind of simulcasting to both feeds. So make sure you do that. I think, ladies and gentlemen, that will do it for uh, the, the big show here today. Um, uh, digging deeper is, uh, we're glad you're here. Great to have Jay Bear. Uh, great to be here with all of you. And uh, if I know what buttons I'm pushing here, we're going to thank you for tuning in and uh, get on out of here. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. Make creativity your business advantage. If you liked the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who... Uh, might as well. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show, email us at jason at teamcornet.com. Digging Deeper is a production of uh, the Cornette Group. Find us online at teamcornet.com. Our executive producers, Kip Cornett, creative directors, Jason Majeski. Associate producers include John Herskin and Ashley Harris. Theme music composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, I'll see you on the interweb.